So let me formally welcome uh, our uh, honorable speakers. Uh, good morning, Dr. Carol and Dr. Jaria. My name is Chiranjeev and I'm currently the chair of CSA department. So it's my pleasure to welcome both of you on behalf of the department to this, to this event of Women in Computing. I'd also welcome this opportunity to welcome my ISC colleagues, especially our director, uh, our dean, and our ex-director, Professor Anurag Kumar. So students and guests from India and abroad who have also joined us, uh, very good evening to all of you. Uh, so this Women in Computing series is a part of Golden Jubilee celebrations or department of CSA. Yes, we are 50 years young and is now the leading CS department in the country. The department is strongly committed to gender equality and since its inception have produced many eminent women scientists. And some current examples include uh, Professor Hima Bindu, who's assistant professor in Harvard, uh, was a master student here. Uh, Dr. Geeta Manjunath, uh, as a PhD from our department, is a co-founder of a leading healthcare startup. Recently, Dr. Suparna Patacharya uh, was uh, nominated as a fellow of Indian National Academy. So there are examples, but I but we are deeply aware that we need to do more. So I congratulate my colleagues, Professor Bhavana and Professor Chaya, for organizing this interesting event. Uh, so which raises, which reflects the commitment of the department to help raise awareness of gender issues. Now the aim of the series aims to celebrate research done by women computer scientists and initiate conversations about diversity uh, to create an ecosystem to encourage and support academic and professional opportunities for women in computing. So today's event uh, would be more uh, like enabling uh, to how to create a good ecosystem. So with this uh, words, I would uh, leave it to uh, our organizers, Bhavna and Chaya to take it forward. Bhavna and Chaya. Oh, thanks, Chiru. Mm -hmm. um, we are delighted to have with us today, Dr. Carol Fries and Dr. Jeria Kuzenberry, and I would like to briefly introduce our speakers. Dr. Carol Fries was director of Women at SES and SES for All in Carnegie Mellon School of Computer Science, working on diversity and inclusion for the past 20 years. Her publications, teaching and research interests focus on the culture of computing, stereotypes and myths, unconscious bias and broadening participation in computing fields. Carol recently retired but continues to teach part-time in the School of Computer Science. Thank you for being with us, Carol. Dr. Jeria Kwezenberry is an Associate Teaching Professor of Information Systems in the Dedrich College of Humanities and Social Sciences at Carnegie Mellon University. Her research interests are directed at the study of cultural influences on information technology students and professionals, including topics of social inclusion, broadening participation, career values, organizational interventions, and work-life balance. Carol and Jeria are co-authors of a book, Kicking Butt in Computer Science, Women in Computing at Carnegie Mellon University. Today, they'll talk about the incredible success story of Carnegie Mellon in creating an environment where about half the number of students who are CS majors are female. Carol, Jeria, over to you. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, Vana, for inviting us and um, your, head, your head of department, Madeed. It's so lovely to to see everybody here. Uh, thank you for such a warm welcome. Lovely. Um, yeah, and also congratulations on your department's Golden Jubilee celebration. Uh, you know, it's lovely for us to be a part of that. Uh, so I won't go any further in introducing myself since Chaya just did a great job there. Um, Juria, did you want to just say hello? before we move along. Yes, hello, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having Carol and me today. We're very excited um, to share with you some of the work we've been doing and hopefully have a rich and productive conversation about um, opportunities that are yet to come. Thank you. In terms of, go ahead, Carol. So I was just going to say we we can uh, you know the, the 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 talk today is based on two books, um, um, one of which we we really hope you love the title "Kicking Butt in Computer Science," um, and "Cracking the Digital Ceiling: Women in Computing Around the World." And Carol and I um, will pass back and forth a little bit, so we will be sharing some information about each one of these books and also have some questions that we would love to hear your thoughts and perspectives on as well. Um, to get us started, though, I'd like to just share a bit of background information that I suspect most of us are already familiar with, but I think it will set 
a foundation uh, for this morning or this evening's conversation, uh, namely why it's important to consider uh, the state of women in computing and that it really does matter and matters on, on many different levels. Uh, at the individual level, um, we all know that working in the computing field can be quite rewarding with many uh, opportunities uh, and there's some equity concerns if it's a situation where um, both men and women are not able to pursue those types of, of wonderful opportunities. At the organizational level, there is research that points to uh, a business case for diversity. So finding that uh, more diverse teams uh, can lead to more innovative products and services. And then at a social or, or global level, we are facing a uh, shortage of information technology, information systems talent. And so um, helping societies to produce uh, qualified entrance into the market is, is quite important going forward. On this slide, uh, you'll see I have some statistics from the US perspective, but we do know from work uh, from such groups such as Corn Ferry that these numbers are on a global scale. To share a little bit more of the numbers, and uh, these numbers that you see on the slide are primarily from the United States and Canada. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about global numbers in, in just a moment, but uh, in terms of the first book, the Kicking Butt book, uh, our motivation in, in part uh, came from what we were seeing uh, in the North American figures. The Computing Research Association every year conducts a tall bay survey and they provide the results of their work that um, shares the numbers of degrees that students have obtained at the undergraduate and graduate levels in the computing field. And so this graph uh, is demonstrating the number of degrees that were granted um, in the most recent study among computer science and computer engineering students. And so looking at this, there uh, is some really positive good news uh, that you can see. Uh, the number of degrees being obtained is on the rise, uh, on a 10 plus year rise, in fact, which is really fantastic. Um, it's been about 12 years of sustained growth. And that last little kind of blip on the graph uh, is about projections. And so projections for um, upcoming years also looks quite positive. So this is really promising news, but unfortunately it's not the full picture. There are some challenges if you um, go down one layer deeper into this data. Again, from a US perspective here on this slide, and we, and we will come back to this um, from a global perspective, but at least looking at the United States and Canada, women uh, represent just about 50% of our population, um, about 50% of the undergraduate degrees that are obtained each year. Um, but on average, women are earning right around 21% of computer science degrees. Uh, so this number is quite low in comparison to their overall representation of college degrees. But also somewhat unsettling is that this number is lower than where it had been back in the 1980s. In fact, in 1984, women earned about 37% of all undergraduate computer science degrees. So the number is low and it, it's come down from where it had been uh, historically. Also, if you look at the state of underrepresented minorities, in particular African Americans and Hispanics, uh, in the US, you can see here um, some additional statistics that are, are troubling that demonstrate uh, that these groups of individuals are also um, very much underrepresented in the field of computing. I'm going to pass it over to Carol now, who will talk a little bit more about um, the Kicking Butt book um, and what has been done at Carnegie Mellon uh, to try and address some of these um, issues that we just raised. Thank you, Jeria. Uh, so yes, this book um, was an attempt to tell a positive story about women in computing, uh, because in the US and in many parts of the Western world, girls and women are not finding it um, a, an environment and a culture in computing um, that welcomes them. Many parents, teachers, children think that computer science is a boys' field. So we wanted to challenge that and show a really 
positive story because even when when uh, women get through computer science and end up in the tech industry we often hear some horror stories about you know their experiences women having bad experiences in, in the tech industry and many of them leaving the program so um Jaria, oh, thank you. Um, if you remember, Jaria showed that in the, the national rates for women in computing in the United States is around 21%. Um, here we show that we, women are kicking butt at CMU in, um, in computer science. We have been higher than national averages for well over 15 years now. And in, in 2017, we, we more or less hit gender uh, parity with, with 49%. And we've sustained that for the past few years. Um, so we are very, very um, happy that something's changed here. And I'm gonna go into a little more detail about what did change. But what's also important is that men and women graduate at the same rate. We have uh, a department at Carnegie Mellon that tracks every student so it's okay for us to say, oh, well, we're bringing in, you know, 50% women in the first year, but are they staying? So retention has been a very, very important issue that, we, that, that we've paid attention to. I'm gonna take you through a little bit about the cultural change. So back in uh, late 1990s, this is pretty much what the student environment look like at the undergraduate level. Many, many more men than women, and this is why we show this kind of identical images, and the backgrounds and attitudes and personalities of the men were very similar. So, you know, this idea that the men were dreaming in code and that it was really the code and the computer itself that they're interested in. They don't want to do anything else. Just, just play around with the computer. For the women, it was something different. The women were found uh, to want to do something useful with the computer. And um, confidence was very low at the time. Um, and many women feeling like they didn't belong actually left the program. There was about five to 10% women at this time. So generally, what the picture showed uh, at this time was that there was this strong gender divide in how men and women were relating to computing. But what we have to remember is that this is not a fixed situation. I'm gonna jump forward to 2000 onwards and we start to see a more balanced culture and environment. We also, we still see the guys dreaming in code, uh, but we also have women who are very um, interested in computers and programming, especially. But what we start to see that's different is we see that the guys are also saying, I want to do more with the computer. It's not just a tool. It's not just a, a toy. It's a tool to do something useful with. Also at this time, we start to see students feeling very um, confident about their, um, their, 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 their being a computer scientist. Uh, Jaria, if you could just click a little more. There we go, thank you. As uh, students start to see themselves as cool, whereas at one time, you know, being a computer science stu student was often thought of as a bit weird. Uh, but now, uh, during this time, we start to see a change in their attitudes. And you can see from this picture that this is a situation now that has shown that um, attitudes can change according to the environment in which students find themselves. This is an environment with uh, many more women, a more balanced environment, and in this environment, women can do very well. Thank you, Jury. So I'm going to um, dig into the interventions now. Jury, please. Hello. 
Have we frozen? No, I can hear you. I can't see the slides, Jaria. Um, uh, yeah, maybe she has some problem with the internet. Let's see. I don't see Jeria online, so maybe she'll join back. Okay, so while we're, while we're waiting for that, maybe I could um, take over the slides. I wonder if I can. Uh, Jeria is back, I think. No, is she I, back? Yeah, yeah, she's back. I'm back. Apologies about that. I lost my internet for a moment. No problem. Welcome back. These things happen, right? <laughs> but it, it did come back, so that's good. <laughs> good. Thank you. Uh, apologies to everybody. Um, uh, I, you, you may be used to this kind of thing by now. I think many of us are. Okay. So, so, so the message I want to we want to get across here is that um, in the 1990s. When the, when the cultural environment was very kind of um, divided, um, women were not doing well. But when we start to make changes, um, we start to see that in fact, women can do as well as their male peers. Thank you, Jurya. So interventions that led to these changes. So one of the major things that happened at Carnegie Mellon was uh, we dropped the programming requirement that was necessary to get into Carnegie Mellon's computer science program. Um, we kept the high, you know, high scores for math and science, but the program, dropping the programming requirement was critical because for the most part in American high schools, it was boys that were taking the, the programming classes and girls were not taking them. And, and also there were many boys that weren't taking them, them too. So by dropping that, we start to see more women and we start to see more students with a broader range of characteristics and interests. So this made a big change. We also developed entry classes for those first years who were coming in with little to no background. Now, apart from that, the curriculum at Carnegie Mellon, which is very, very rigorous, was not changed to be female friendly. It was often thought at the time that that did happen. We were often asked, how did you change the curriculum to be female friendly? But that did not happen. Um, if you think about it, you know, um, faculty do not change curriculums to suit one gender over another. That just would not make sense. But we did have to, to fight that argument at times. Uh, let's dig a little deeper into the interventions. So also at this time, Dean Raj Reddy had this vision that Carnegie Mellon should be produced as leaders in the field. And this was the start of institutional support for change. This was so important, institutional support. Just really, I cannot stress, how important this is. It couldn't, we couldn't have made change without that. Um, and we've sustained that institutional support all the way through. At the same time, Lenore Blanc joined the faculty. And I believe some of you met Lenore in a talk the other day, which I'm so happy to hear she, you got to hear from her. So Lenore came in with, with great expertise an advocacy for women in math and science. I joined her in 2000. Um, and then one thing you haven't heard about um, uh, so far is the development of this organization, Women at SCS, which was uh, really credited with helping to change the culture so that women could, could succeed alongside their male peers. And the, uh, uh, the driving force for women at SCS was really to ensure that the women had the same experiences, the same social opportunities that the guys were getting. Um, guys probably didn't even notice they were getting these um, extra opportunities. But, you know, when you're in a majority like the guys were, um, that can happen without even noticing it. And digging a little deeper. Okay. What made women at SCS so successful for retention was again, that institutional support. 
support from the faculty, from administrations, financial, so that we could carry out events and activities. But it also had to fit the value of the school, uh, really fit the value of the school, belief that women can do this, right? Uh, we had a lot of student leadership from the beginning, letting students take the, take the lead uh, in, organize, in, in organizing committees for events and activities. And again, the guiding objectives, leveling the playing field, ensuring that women did not miss out. Now, we had, we start, as we started to notice change, we felt it was important to monitor what was going on. So we started doing research studies just to see, you know, to get deeper into what was going on among the students at that time. Um, going on again to um, the steps for success. So building community was essential. All our students and faculty and uh, postdocs and staff have chances to get together for networking again. So, so that when students come in, they're entering a community already. And this goes on, we continue building the community. Um, first years can come in and, and opt to have a mentor, uh, one, an older student who've been through the program. So these are things that um, really help to establish the community across all years and across all levels. One of the next things that's very important was building professional skills. So we send our students to conferences every year and in particular, the Grace Hopper Conference, which I think uh, many students here today and uh, faculty may, may uh, have participated in. And I believe there's um, Grace Hopper in India now too, uh, which makes it easier to attend. Uh, another thing we do with our students is we give them practice in building these skills, public speaking skills, interviewing practice, and invited speakers. Sometimes it's speakers that are helping with these events. Sometimes it's student to student. And another important thing that we found as a, a step for success is outreach. Our students love to go out as teams and talk to um, children, to teachers, to parents, and talk to them about computer science. What is computer science? So many kids just do not know what this field is in the US. It can be something of a mystery. It's not always taught in, in schools. Um, we also run a program on campus called Tech Nights, uh, which is for middle school girls. They come in. Um, these are local girls that come in and our students teach them a different workshop, uh, a different tech subject, a different aspect of computer science every week. And then we also want to encourage our undergraduate women to think about the next step, go into graduate school, go to master's, go, do your PhD, you know, take your skills as far as they'll go. And we run this RCS three-day research uh, workshop where students come in from around the world, um, India, we've had lots of students from India actually, um, to participate, to work for three days with one of our faculty on a research problem. So they get experience in research, which is new for many of them. And they also get encouragement to think about the next step. And they also, um, get a chance to, you know, meet faculty and graduate students and hear about the process for applying to graduate school. So as we develop these activities for um, our women, many of the men came to us and said, hey, we want to participate in some of these events. So we decided it was time to start working on another organization that in many ways reflected a lot of the programs we were doing with women at SES, but was broader, much broader. Um, so we started this organization called SES for All, which as you can imagine, you know, just, just, just brought in both men and women, but again, kept that idea that it's for faculty, staff, 
students, um, social and professional opportunities. Um, here you can see uh, some of the posters we use for advertising events. Uh, the one on the left, um, where no faculty allowed, is an event that we run right before students register for, uh, for their classes, they register for their classes. Um, and what it is, is students get together and they talk about the professors, they talk about the classes. It's very honest. I call it the gossip that goes on anyway. Um, so the younger students can get peer-to-peer -peer advice from, from other students. It's a very popular event, as you can imagine. And then in terms of social events, trivia. Uh, our students love trivia. And we have a wonderful trivia night uh, every year. And again, it's faculty, it's staff, it's students. Um, it, it's building that community, which makes everybody feel welcome, which is so important. And now I think I'm going to hand over to Jaria, who's going to dig more deeply into the studies we do. Thank you, Carol. Uh, as Carol mentioned earlier, one of the um, driving components of women at SCS was to conduct ongoing research assessments of the success of the interventions. Um, in the book, Kicking Butt, we go into much more depth on the various case studies that we've conducted, but generally we've held um, five separate case studies ranging from 2002 to 2017, where we conducted uh, surveys, focus groups, observations with students um, across the college, both at the undergraduate and the graduate level, uh, and then at times also conversations with, with faculty and staff. So this um, many kind of longitudinal perspective, um, many studies of the women in CS fit has uh, allowed us to look uh, at some of the evolutions and changes. Um, many of those interventions that Carol has spoken about, we were able to um, look at the ways in which these are helping to improve the culture and the climate of the School of Computer Science, uh, and then also take a look at our students and uh, that broad range of perspectives and mindsets that Carol mentioned, how that's evolved and grown over the last many years. Uh, in the book, we go into these five different themes or areas, um, places in which we've seen some interesting changes and in growth, uh, things like the computing family, um, perceptions of computer science, what it is as a field, what it can be used for, um, ways in which students are challenging the stereotypes. Carol mentioned this idea of, you know, a geek culture um, and maybe reassuming that and being proud of some of the um, intellectual components of studying computer science. Um, perceptions of individual performance and then an overall culture of inclusion. In the interest of time, we won't um, provide a lot of depth, but again, much of this is covered in the book, but we did pull out a few things that we find um, to be pretty interesting that we wanted to share with you today. Uh, on this slide here, you can see a snapshot of some of the data from the most recent case study that we conducted in 2017. Um, in this case study, we held face-to-face -face interviews with students in their second year of study at the undergraduate level. Uh, the reason uh, for holding the study with the sophomores was because there had been um, some shifts in the curriculum to make it more theoretical in nature. And so we were looking to see how the um, curriculum shift back to more of a theory perspective may be influencing or impacting the culture. Now what uh, jumps out at us, and hopefully you see this as well, uh, is that there is a lot of similarities between the responses of the female and the male students. Um, both in terms of if they feel like they're fitting in academically and socially, um, very, very similar responses. Um, also, we were happy to see that for the most part, students feel as though they were fitting in academically and, and a little bit lesser extent, but still quite positive above 40%. They felt as though they, they were fitting in socially. Um, I'll also draw your attention to the representative quotes down here on the bottom right. Uh, we really love to see this similar language between our female and male students really describing that they feel like a computer science major at heart. Um, and we should also mention, and perhaps you heard this um, before we started the talk, the book, Kicking Butt, that quote actually came um, 
from one of our students in the studies. So that those are not our words, those are, are our students' words that we uh, were using to, to title the book. But overall, um, some takeaway themes from these um, five different case studies is that we really have seen a shift in attitude since uh, the late 1990s. And Carol described this um, with some of those representative quotes and images. Uh, we've also seen that there's a spectrum of attitudes, um, including many similarities between our male and female students. Uh, sense of belonging uh, has increased for both male and female students. And we're seeing um, less and less of a gender divide among our students. Uh, the only outlier to that, um, we have seen instances where our female students feel as though their confidence level perhaps uh, has decreased or has not increased as quickly as some of the male students believe uh, their confidence levels have, despite um, GPAs. GPAs, um, their grades in school are consistent, but it's really more of a perception of confidence. Um, we've studied this in more depth and we'd be happy to talk about it if it's of interest to the group, um, but we generally see this as more of a reflection of a, of a cultural societal uh, scenario as opposed to something that's happening within just the college. Um, some key takeaways uh, from, from this work that we've done at CMU. Um, first and foremost is that we really think sharing success stories are important. Um, we know changing culture um, is difficult. It's not something that can just easily be done overnight, um, but it is something that can happen and can change. And finding ways to demonstrate um, that that accomplishment is really important and sharing stories that have done that um, is important. So that being said, cultural change is key, not focusing on gender differences, but looking for ways in which uh, the culture can be improved for both male and female students. And that may be recognizing that there are more similarities than differences between the groups. Finding ways to let women, women lead the way. Uh, we've talked about women at SCS and SCS for All. Um, those are two great interventions that have worked well at, at Carnegie Mellon uh, in making that happen. Being open uh, to changing or challenging the, the status quo. Um, maybe that could mean things like broadening what the worker profile looks like. Um, in our case, it was um, dropping that programming requirement from admissions, um, looking to find things that might be presenting themselves as obstacles and having um, the way with all to make some changes. Um, working to level the, play, the playing field. So looking around to see what those in the majority have, what is a privilege that comes from that perspective and then trying to find ways to offer that um, to everyone. And then really recognizing that institutional support is critical. Um, no surprise that Carol spent some time really talking about our leadership at the university and the ways in which they have supported these initiatives has, has been quite essential. So having um, done this work together, Carol and I um, had the luxury of really focusing in on the Carnegie Mellon experience and, and looking to see how these interventions were helping to shape and improve the culture. Um, but along the way, we really kept um, coming back to some guiding questions about um, places in the world where women were leading the way, um, places in the world where culture really was making a difference, and then just a curiosity about where there might be some similar similarities or potentially cultural differences about the obstacles and catalysts um, around the world that were or are influencing women's participation in computing. We've come across a few case examples of um, some countries and areas that were doing things well, and that really intrigued us and wanted us to explore and um, learn a little more. And so that's what brought us to um, our second book, Cracking the Digital Ceiling, Women in Computing Around the World. Um, the intent of this book was, like I said, to take a broader perspective, to look at a wide range of um, perspectives and um, really try to debunk or um, uh, prove untrue some of the myths and many questions that we were um, getting and being asked about women in computing, things like, um, you know, are women successful in computing anywhere around the world? And we were really hoping that this would be a wake-up call to examine what some of those obstacles and catalysts look like. 
Um, the book is an edited manuscript. Um, so there are a series of chapters throughout the book. Um, we have nearly 20 different uh, country cases and several cross-cultural studies. In fact, three of our chapters um, look at either regions or many cultures throughout the world in comparison. Um, one chapter, uh, in fact, looks specifically at 50 different countries. So um, we're very proud uh, to say that we think we have a wide representation of perspectives. So the CMU story in the Kicking Butt book goes very, very deep. But in um, the second book, we are able to take a bit more of a broader perspective. Um, on the map here, you can see some of the specific uh, countries and cultures that are represented. I have a few more uh, slides that I'd like to talk through um, with some of the, the key takeaways and themes um, from the chapters in the book. And one of the first uh, really important themes that we wanted to share is this notion of um, women leading the way and places in the world where they are succeeding, they are kicking butt in the computing field, if you will. Um, if you refer back to the earlier data Carol and I presented, at least in the United States, um, women are earning about 21% of undergraduate computer science degrees, um, you know, are underrepresented in the workforce as well. Um, on this slide, we are summarizing some of the really positive figures um, that we were able to, to pull out of the data that demonstrate women are successful in computing. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see some statistics of um, women's educational degree attainment, some percentages there that are on par with um, the male students' degree attainment. And then on the right-hand side, um, we have some statistics of a few countries where um, women have a, a nice or a more equal representation in the computing profession. So this certainly tells um, some interesting uh, perspectives, some positive, some positive um, pieces to hold on to. One of the things um, that came out of this book that Carol and I were, were really quite um, surprised and interested uh, to, to learn about and to see is that higher levels of um, societal gender equality doesn't necessarily demonstrate or show increased numbers of women in computing. Um, in fact, there seems to be very little improvement between uh, modern economies and women's participation in computing. Uh, the graph that you see on this slide in front of you, we've pulled out from one of the chapters in the book that was written by um, Chow and Charles. And this was the meta-analysis chapter I mentioned earlier in those 50 um, countries around the world. What you see here um, plotted on this graph is the human development index. This is a composite of some um, metrics like national income, uh, health, education, um, various classification items from the United Nations that develops um, a bit of an equality model. Um, so a country with a higher HDI on the scale would be deemed to be more of a socially equal society. Um, what you see then on the other side of the graph is women's um, percentage of the ICT profession. So a higher percentage there, meaning they represent more of the ICT professionals in that country. And some of the countries that you would perhaps have a perception of as being um, socially um, equal, places like Switzerland, Norway, Germany, Luxembourg, you can see scoring very high on HDI, but much, much lower as a percentage of ICT. Meanwhile, some other countries that are scoring very high um, on the percentage of women in the ICT profession, places like the Philippines and Thailand, having um, a slightly lower score on the HDI side. So this was quite interesting um, sort of turning on its head what might be an initial um, misconception of what leads to a higher percentage of women in, in ICT. Another important takeaway from the book is that um, we have found countless examples that men and women do not have different intellectual potentials. And so we very much reject the notion that you know, innately a woman's brain is constructed in this way and a male brain is constructed in this way and fundamentally they are opposed or operate in a different way. Um, instead, we very much think that culture matters and it's the way in which culture shapes us. And as we grow and, 
enter school and learn ways in which um, topics and themes and skills are reinforced or perhaps not encouraged. And so we uh, encourage or argue that we turn to these cultural factors such as opportunities, encouragement, expectations, advocacy, um, not innate potential to see which factors are contributing to women's um, participation in computing. We have a, um, a couple slides now with a few examples, um, case studies, if you will, from the book. Um, on this slide, you can see here from India and Malaysia. In terms of uh, India, we were really excited um, to see from both our author, um, Chow and Charles, uh, Roly Varma has a chapter, um, and Hewer talks a little bit about this as well, that um, in India, just over 40%, about 42% of undergraduates enrolled in information technology and computer science were women um, in some of the most recent studies. And this is obviously something that, that you know, and we're very excited to be here to talk with you today and would love to hear um, some feedback from you and your, your perspective about um, how this um, level of representation has been obtained. You, what are the factors that are um, fostering uh, this representation and where some possibilities lie um, for potential future growth. Uh, in terms of the work that really Varma uh, wrote about in her chapter, she pointed to things like um, lucrative jobs, economic independence as um, a driving factor for women entering um, the information technology or computing field, uh, that the work environment being clean, safe, and protected, and then the very strong family encouragement um, that many women were receiving from um, their parents to um, enter the field. We also have a chapter in the book that points to the Malaysian experience. Um, there's also some very positive cultural influences that have been at play uh, to help encourage women to enter that field. And I think um, what is probably the most interesting in that sense is that there does not seem to be a preconceived um, belief that male or men are more suited for the field that both boys and girls can um, succeed in the field equally. Uh, Israel also um, presents an interesting case study. Um, Hazan et al. Um, in their chapter go deeper into two sectors within Israel, the um, Jewish Israeli sector and the Arab um, Israeli sector. Uh, as you know, Israel is a small country in the Middle East. Um, but they have these two core populations. Um, and in their study, they found that um, there is some gender balance in computer science, at least for the Arab sector, um, more, more so than the um, Jewish sector. Um, that holds true also then at the undergraduate level. And pointing to this, um, again, many of the cultural factors as an explanation as to why um, so many fem female Arab students are succeeding in computing. And then um, finally, just as a kind of a, um, a, a last case example, um, we have a chapter that focuses on China by Zhang and Yin that um, discusses the role of entrepreneurship in the internet industry in China and the fact that um, women have had um, quite a bit of success in that space, um, more so than in the traditional kind of computing profession, but really focusing in on entrepreneurs. Um, they've been a leading force in that space. Uh, this brings us to another takeaway um, from the book that was quite interesting coming out of many of the chapters, and it deals with this notion of choice. Um, you know, at its face value, choice can be a really good thing. Um, choice allows for autonomy, flexibility, freedom, um, but it's important to keep in mind that choice is influenced by um, perceptions and at times gender norms, which can, can be bad. Um, if, if computing is plagued with some stereotypes, things like it's you know, just coding or it's isolated work, it's antisocial work, really more of a boy's field, if you will, which is a lot of the, the perception that we see in the West, um, is that then something that a female or a woman would really kind of choose on her own accord. Um, if computing is perceived as a boy's field, can we realistically then think um, women would like to choose or pursue that? And so this notion of what 
what is an option um, and what can be available is something that we saw a lot of interesting uh, discussion about in the book. So I'd like to um, just share two last takeaways before I turn it back to Carol to um, wrap up our discussion today. Uh, the first is about these obstacles. As I said, one of the driving forces for this second book was to look um, throughout the world at a variety of perspectives to identify if there were similarities or differences between these obstacles and catalysts. And we did in fact find that there can be variation from culture, but at times those categories um, held true, held um, consistent. In terms of the obstacles, we have some of them listed here. Um, I think they boil down to things like um, the image of the field, uh, if it's a negative image or one that's um, overly simplistic, especially relying on um, stereotypes that are not attractive, that can be problematic. Um, beliefs about women and their intellectual potential. Um, the role of family and support systems, particularly when they are discouraging um, their girls to enter computing. And I didn't talk about this a lot in the earlier slides, but most definitely in the example of China and, and some other countries, expectations for motherhood and what um, paid employment could look like for women um, once they became mothers. That can also be a, a, a major obstacle for many women. Um, in terms of uh, the Indian perspective, the Hewer chapter goes into more depth on some of these obstacles. And again, we would very much um, like to hear your perspectives and ideas, um, but some things like what are expectations um, for family and working? Uh, those are some items that came out of Hewer's chapter. Um, mobility restrictions, um, you know, career advancement, so on and so forth. Uh, in terms of catalysts, though, we found that there are um, several things that are promoting women's success in the computing field globally. Um, and some of these are opposite from what we saw in the obstacles, um, and then a few additional new ones here. But of course, um, positive perceptions, um, things that promote the opportunities and strengths of the field um, can be a motivating factor for women to enter the space. Um, things like lucrative pay, independence, so on and so forth, all those are, are quite positive. Um, encouragement from family, teachers, guidance counselors, support structures, um, and cultures that really focus on the similarities between um, men and female and the potential. Um, I mentioned this in the example of Malaysia as being um, a catalyst, um, really driving more women into the field. And then having uh, interventions or opportunities uh, in early education to be exposed to computing, to um, gain some skills in that space and understand what the field is about, uh, and some thoughtful policy interventions that can help with that as well. So I'm going to turn it back to Carol at this point to um, wrap up the themes from the two books, and then hopefully we can um, move into more of a Q&A or a discussion. Thank you, Julia. Um, Okay, so um, we still have a lot of work to do, as I believe um, it was either your dean or your department head said, we, you have work to do, we all have work to do uh, to improve the situation for women in computing. But uh, we, we felt after what we looked at at Carnegie Mellon and, and, and the study from around the globe, that one of the most important things is to challenge this idea of intellectual potential that you know, men and women have different, different brains. Now, we have to remember, we're not talking about social expectations or social gender norms, which play a huge part as well. We're focusing on this idea of intellectual potential. Um, neuroscience, is starting to show how we create these differences among our boys and girls from such an early age. And as gender point, as Jerry pointed out, when boys and girls grow up thinking they can do anything, they can do computer science, um, they can do the same things, they're not being steered into different careers, then it's more likely that girls will enter the field and do well in computer science. So, we have to start challenging these stereotypes. And we don't, we want to stop perpetuating stereotypes um, because they just 
um, don't help the situation at all. Uh, there's this awful book that's very popular in the US and many parts of the Western world called Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. Even, you know, suggests that men and women are from different planets, you know, and it's a terrible book, but it's been a huge bestseller and it contributes to this culture of difference, you know, gender difference without any science behind it. Um, things like uh, in the US, these t-shirts were uh, um, uh, directed at middle school kids. You know, the, the, the girls could do things like shopping, music, dancing, but not math. If you notice on the image there, the math box is not checked. While the boys could have big ideas, uh, 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 while the girls had to just smile. Um, these actually were banned. Parents intervened and the, uh, produ pr pr the company changed, changed these t-shirts, thank goodness. And then another thing, um, Juria noticed this one. So uh, if many of you are familiar with Barbie, it's very popular in, in, in the US, this company, Mattel. Um, they came out with um, engineer Barbie and, and Jaria pointed out how, you know, how happy she was with her little girl to see the engineer came along. But when she looked more closely at the text in the book, uh, Barbie was saying things like, oh, I'm only creating the design ideas. I'll need uh, Stephen and Brian's help to turn it into a real game. So there you're getting mixed, you know, these mixed messages. Um, on one hand, it seems like a step forward, but um, it's not entirely great. Of course, Barbie, um, more recently, uh, we've seen some progress here. She still has the same cute figure that I don't know that's ever going to change. Um, but she, she can be a game developer, a robotics engineer, and, and a computer engineer. So we were really pleased to see that. Uh, and finally, we want to finish on a little story about interventions, how, how we can make, we can intervene. You know, we don't have to be academics. We don't have to be scientists. We can, we can intervene from a different direction. And this is a story from Lego that some of you, you may know. Um, in 1974, Lego announced to parents that uh, they should just let kids play with Lego, let them build, because using Lego helps uh, develop dexterity and pattern recognition, problem solving, um, all these skills that can be useful for our kids, right? In the 70s and 80s, this is in this, this image here, 1981, this is what my kids played with, right? The box of Lego, um, different colors, different shapes, just build. They were pretty unisex and, you know, kids just played and built and we encouraged that kind of activity. Now, by 2011, 90% of Legos were developed with boys in mind, 90%. So you see a, a big shift. Suddenly the market is gearing Legos towards boys and those skills that I mentioned you know, um, we're helping boys, but not, not girls. Of course, the company noticed this. They noticed that there was a, a gap in the market and they came out with um, something called Lego Friends, which, which was pink and it was decidedly aimed at girls, um, which again is a mixed message. But then along came this little girl called Charlotte and I'm going to read this out because it's hard to hard to, to, to see from the screen. And Charlotte says, and this is 2014, by the way. Dear Lego Company, my name is Charlotte. I'm seven years old and I love Legos, but I don't like that there are more boy people and barely any girl Legos. Today I went to a store and I saw Legos in two sections, the pink for girls and the blue for boys. All the girls did was sit at home, go to the beach and shop. And they had no jobs, but the boys went on adventures. They worked, they saved people and they had jobs. 
They even swam with sharks. I want you to make more Lego Girl people and let them go on adventures and have fun. Okay, thank you from Charlotte. And guess what? In 2014, Lego developed the first, what you might call female scientists, right? The paleontologist, the astronomer. Um, so we're happy to see a change. And then in 2017, they came out with women of the women of NASA set. And I think they've been encouraged again by parents, by kids, by teachers to go even further with this so that both boys and girls can experience Lego as a good skill making uh, toy to play with. So thank you, everybody. We, we are happy that um, you've been very patient with us and listened to our talk. And um, we're very happy to take any questions. And uh, as Juria pointed out, we'd be really interested to hear uh, viewpoints on those obstacles and catalysts that you find in Indian culture that we may not have um, fully understood.